Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 259. The real 259, not the fake 259 like I started last episode. This episode is just me asking your questions to contributing editor Raleigh Johnson. He is just as knowledgeable as it comes in regards to tools and hand tools and machinery and woodworking techniques. He's, he's, Raleigh's really got it all. One thing Raleigh doesn't have is a great internet connection though. And this brings up a point that sometimes when the internet connection is not great or the sound quality or a microphone isn't great, there are complaints and I hear you. And I do absolutely everything I can within my power to make sure that there's redundancies and backups and extra microphones and all sorts of things to make the production of this show as high quality as I can. But sometimes those redundancies fail. And on this episode, we are left with Raleigh's somewhat sketchy Zoom connection. And the information is fantastic and I'm not going to throw it out because of a few little glitchy hiccups. So if you are one of those people who will complain about the audio quality of your woodworking information, this is not your episode. Oh, and as an added bonus on this episode, Zoom decided not to record my end of the video. So nobody on YouTube has to look at me. It's just Raleigh. And that's probably for the best because y'all see enough of me. One last note, we're pretty excited about how Mike's online foundations course is going. And we're really excited to tell you about the next online course at Fine Woodworking and Taunton Press are presenting. This one's gonna be with SketchUp guru extraordinaire Dave Richards. And he's gonna take you from SketchUp beginner to being able to model almost any project you want. The course will be produced by former Shop Talk Live host, Tom McKenna. If you are interested in that course and want to find out more information about it, I'll have a link in the show notes and in the YouTube doobly-doo. You put your email in and we'll send you an email when all of the pertinent information is available. All right. Without further ado, Raleigh Johnson. I, I, I was just clicking around through the folders the other day, the Shop Talk Live folders, and I clicked on your name and all of a sudden there was like eight questions. I was like, oh man, I really need to get Raleigh on the show. So I here we are. And I decided, solo show, Raleigh shouldn't have to argue with anyone. Raleigh shouldn't have to compete with anyone. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> and just so that the listeners know, I, I haven't prepped you at all on this. This is all going to be right from right off the cuff, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Come on. You don't, you don't need prep time. No, no. Raleigh Johnson. I can, I can make a total fool of myself easily anytime. <laughs> <laughs> and I will happily record it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anytime. All right. So this first one is from Nicholas. Um, I'm in the market for adding my, my first dust collector. I'm hoping to get as much use of this as possible and either duct it to multiple, multiple machines and uh, table saw, bandsaw, jointer, planer, sander, or move it around the shop. Either option works for me and isn't a huge factor, although I'm sure I'd use it more religiously if I didn't have to move it from machine to machine. What factors that are weighing most heavily in my mind are CFM and one versus two stage collectors? Um, is it better to sacrifice some CFM for the benefit of a cyclone or should or would greater CFM always win out? I I like the cyclone because it does separate the heavy stuff from the small particles. It seems to uh, give you cleaner air in the end, um, and your filters stay fresh longer. So of course uh, your uh, velocity and CFM will actually probably stay high longer with a cyclone than they will with a single. And, um, yeah, I, I would definitely go with the cyclone. Okay. Over like, so I don't know the numbers, but say you had 1200 CFM with the cyclone and 1500 CFM without a cyclone, um, probably over time because the filter staying cleaner, you're going to wind up with more consistent CFM. You think? I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I don't have the science to prove it from, experience that uh that would seem to be the way it works best yeah and um, what 
How many dust collectors do you have in your shop? I just have one. I've got uh, four four shop vacs in there and one dust collection. And I use the shop vac for you know a lot of things like uh, uh, orbital sanders, different things like that, where you can plug directly into them, small tools, and just general cleanup. Uh, but as far mm-hmm. as all my major tools, they're all on my dust collector. And uh, how many horsepower? Uh, it's uh, five horse. Okay, so you've got a big ducted system. Yeah, no, not really. I've got that new Oneida system, and uh, it's it's four inch ducts, um, and uh, it's it's kind of a novel concept in that it's high velocity and high volume. They claim it's it's like the world's biggest uh, dust uh, uh, shop vac. And uh, yeah, okay, so you have a supercell as well. Yeah, we, yeah. we just we we have two of them hooked up down at the new shop. And uh, it took me a while to wrap my head around like four inch ducks running everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you want to see yeah. that big 12 inch duct into six. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, but that's, that's run to all of your machines. Yeah. You know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that wouldn't have been a real great machine because we had straight knives in everything in our shops. And I used to fight my planer all the time when I had six inch ducting because it's only a four inch coming out of the planer. And I used to use poplar a lot for armatures, for you know, mill work, for veneering and different things like that. Well, you run a 10 inch wide poplar board through your planer, you have 10 inch wide curls and they stay together really well. So they would tend to plug up outlet on it. And so uh-huh. you would be planing and all of a sudden you got sawdust flying all over, shut it down, clean everything out and go back to it. Well, now I have segmented cutters in my joiner and planer. They make little bitty chips, you know, size of your little yeah. hand. And a system like that can pick them up and carry them. Now it's it's getting to the point where you want more velocity than volume. You don't worry so much about volume. You want velocity to pick those chips up and get them out of there. And also the velocity will help contain the fine sawdust around the piece of equipment because you've got a lot more air going through a whole lot faster. And so it does, it does an amazing job. It really does. And uh, it's better than, you know, CFM. Uh, do I need the volume? No, I don't, I don't have big milling machines that are just producing copious quantities of sawdust. Um, my biggest um, shavings producer is my 15 inch planer. That's, on occasion, running a 12 or 15 inch panel through it, but most of the time, yeah. five and six inch wide material you're running. You may stagger it and run them together, but still, the small chips, they're, uh, they're a lot easier to pick up if you have high velocity. So interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. I've, n- I've, okay. So, yeah, I have just started using the tools in the new shop. We've got segmented cutter heads on everything. Uh, one thing that I immediately noticed was uh, the volume was, yeah. they're much quieter. Yeah. It's yeah. a, it's, it's, it's a much less abrasive sound. Yeah. Um, but uh, honestly, I, I hadn't thought about the smaller chips adding to, uh, to being easier to collect, but that makes absolute sense. Sure. And that's why a four inch ducting, you know, that's what they recommend to use it is just four inch ducting. It's perfect because it has, yeah. it has enough volume in it to pick up anything that we produce in our shops. Um, would I want it at my commercial shop? No, because we, you know, we made big piles of sawdust then. But for this, mm-hmm. for our shops, it's, it's ideal. Yeah. Interesting. That's super, super interesting. Um, and I guess one thing that we should go back to is uh, the cyclone separates out um, all of the chips so that it's not hitting the filter. Right. Um, And basically, so what that's going to do is keep the filter cleaner for, you know, for months, probably, you know, it's, it's, it's not a problem um, with it getting clogged up. Um, well, yeah, it, so, it still is. It's just not going to do it quite as fast. But um, yeah, yeah. When I had my my uh, 
old uh, uh, cyclone, it had an internal filter in it, and that would get plugged up fairly quickly. So okay, yeah, depends on where the filter is, and but the, with the external filters now and the big filters, yeah, it takes a while to to plug them up. Okay, so one one more aspect of Nicholas's question. Um, let's see, I've stipulated to myself that I'd get a one micron filter. Is this really necessary for the occasional hobbyist woodworker? Should I consider, say, a five or thirty micron filter, which would allow me to get more suction out of a similar system? Do you have thoughts on on micron size? I don't know. Uh, one seems to be almost the HEPA standards. Uh, you're gonna have real clean air, but yeah, it's gonna be more restrictive. Uh, five millimeter. You know, if you're if you're in that shop all day long creating sawdust and didn't have a secondary air cleaner, then you'd probably probably want to be more critical about particle size. But I would think mm -hmm. five, I would think five micron would be fine. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think that's that's such a key for people like like me and Nicholas, where it's it's uh, you know, you're not making sawdust all day. Right. Um, I think all of the PPE stuff goes, you know, gets cranked up to max when you're in there eight hours a day with machines running and sure. dust and, spewing. And, yeah. and especially if you're doing a lot of uh, manufactured board, if you've got a lot of particle board and plywood and different things that you're working, those, those, that sawdust is a lot more toxic than, you know, the, the stuff we're using where we're using solid wood. So like, yeah, that, that totally plays into it. It does. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, all right. So let's see the next one. Specifically for Raleigh Johnson. Oh my! Uh, Christopher asks this, and he said you should really have him on more, <laughs> with an exclamation hey, point. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in my shop, I have the usual major power tools: table saw, jointer, planer, drill press. But I sorely miss not having a bandsaw. Um, you wrote the book on the bandsaw. Right? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I have managed to get by with a jigsaw for some tasks, but a jigsaw can't resaw lumber in a shop made veneer, which among other bandsaw tasks is something I'd really like to be able to do. I think I would love to have a 20 inch bandsaw. Wouldn't we all? Yeah. But there's no way I, I could get such a big ticket item like that through the spousal budget committee. I've watched Matthias Wandel of woodgears.ca make his various bandsaws on YouTube, as well as one made on, uh, and this one was new to me on the, Peosan woodworking channel. Um, the videos make it seem quite doable to make your own bandsaw for a fraction of the cost of a store-bought one. But I wonder if the results are comparable. Uh, what parts of a bandsaw, if any, are just not suited to user fabrication? Are there any safety issues? What do I need to know about choosing the right motor? Uh, I have 220 available. So, so I sent you a couple of videos beforehand. Yep. What do you think of these wooden bandsaws? Well, Gilliam has been around forever. Uh, Gilliam was kind of the company that that got the whole, you know, plywood bandsaw. They, they you could get plans for table saws. You can get plans for sanders, all kinds of things from Gilliam, and uh, um, it was a way to get into a bigger tool for a very moderate price. Uh, especially back okay. after World War II and into the fifties, you know. It, Everybody wanted to build the stuff in popular mechanics, and and Gilliam was right there. Gilliam actually advertised in the early fine woodworking magazines. And uh, oh, I have to dig up some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was it was a real novel concept. And, and Matthias has built uh, some pretty uh, interesting tools, as Matthias does. You know, he's he's amazing what he can build. Uh, he makes it look a lot easier, and I think it probably is uh, because he's <laughs> he's used to doing a lot of this stuff. Um, and there are a lot of good old cast iron bandsaws that are available for reasonable prices. And yeah, you'll you'll get in pretty cheap. Although now with the price of good quality uh, uh, plywood and lumber, not going to get in as cheap as you could a year ago. Uh, they that's an interesting thought. Yeah, yeah, it's gone up quite a bit. Uh, it's just that um, there are so many uh, areas where you have to be really precise to make sure that everything's going to work out. The, the wheels have to be coplanar. 
the upper guidepost has to be very rigid without any play in it. Um, just a lot of little details that could add up to frustration if you haven't built one before or you know are real comfortable with building tools. Uh, my suggestion would be to look for a good used 18 inch bandsaw and uh, and go from there. Uh, I did a lot of resawing and, and work on a good old 14 inch uh, delta with the riser block in it. That was my main mm -hmm. bandsaw for a number of years. 12 inches under the guides. Um, I pumped up the power a little bit. I had a horse and three quarter on it, which is, is adequate. You're not going to saw fast in real tall material, but that's not something that most people do all day long anyway. Uh, it's kind of a rarity when we resaw really tall material. Uh, so, you know, if you can buy a good used 18 or even 14 inch bandsaw, uh, they're inexpensive and easy to rebuild, and you'll have, I, in my estimation, a better saw in the long run. Uh, you know, if you if you're really good at building tools and real fussy about all the all of the, um, what should we say, dimensions and squareness, mm -hmm. so that everything works out. Yeah, you could. Do, uh, there's going to be a considerable amount of time invested if your time is worth anything then it's going to get expensive if it's you're doing it just for fun well the you can you can do it you can make them and they work uh so but my suggestion would be get get a, get an iron one. and don't get one get two everybody needs two bandsaws in their shop <laughs> my my peak was seven you know and and i have three <laughs> i have three now that i use on a regular basis so now, see, I, I think everyone needs one and a friend with a big one. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That gets, you know, that, um, yeah, <laughs> I've got a, I've got a 14 inch cast iron, uh, with, with the riser block. Yeah. Um, and it works great. There are times I actually think about taking the riser block off. And I don't know why. Um, and the only thing that keeps me from doing it necessarily is the stack of blades that I bought. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> But um, I never seem to resaw more than five or six inches with it. Um, that's what we and, have for lumber. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Th that's ninety. And um, there was one time recently that I had a big wide board, and I had to shoot a video with Bob Van Dyke at his school, and I just handed it to him and said, "Resaw this for me, please." <laughs> <laughs> and he was more than happy to do it and uh, and show off his his how how tuned up his, his, his 20 inch was, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, yeah, I, I would, if, if you have no bandsaw, just getting a 14 inch cast iron bandsaw is going to be life changing. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, and if you were the type of person who wants to be able to say at the end of the day, Hey, I made that bandsaw, uh, go for it. Like, come on. That's sure. cool. That's cool yeah. as heck. Uh, I just don't think you're right. Price of plywood, you're not gonna save any money. Yeah. <laughs> well, you will. That's that over buying a new bandsaw, but you know, there's there's a lot of bandsaws out there for sale for reasonable prices. You just have to uh just have to be diligent on crisis, you know, and keep keep your yeah, eye. yeah. Yeah, I almost feel like Facebook Marketplace, believe it or not, is has sure. been my go-to for for that stuff now. Yeah, that's gaining uh, that's gaining traction quickly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, let's see. This question is from Aaron. Um, this is an interesting one. Most modern woodworking chisels and plane irons are made from O1, A2, or similar steels like PMV 11. However, pretty much any other tool, both woodworking and metalworking is made from high speed steel, drill bits, taps and dies, wood lathe tools, machining tools, even knives for planers and joiners. Why are chisels and plane blades different? So we can sharpen them. <laughs> is know? that really it? Well, I mean, high-speed steel is great for things that are going to be at high speed, that are going to develop higher temperatures. We don't get real high temperatures on our plane blades and our chisels. And uh, Wait, really? That's what high speed steel means how am i that dumb to have not put together that high speed yeah means it's high speed. speed yeah exactly it's where it's got a lot of friction <laughs> going on and uh 
So no, the 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 uh, O1 is high carbon steel that is you know uh, tempered to a certain degree, and as far as I'm concerned, that is the best that's up there. Simply because you can get a really good edge on it; it holds it for a relatively long period of time, depending on what you're using it for, and it's quick to hone or sharpen, so that you don't spend so much time sharpening the A2. Man, that stuff's miserable because, yeah, it'll hold an edge a little longer. And I don't think it holds as nice of an edge as the O1, the high carbon, because that edge is a little more brittle and you get a magnifying glass on it after you've used it a little bit and you've got little chips out of it, little chunks gone because it it fractures easier than the high carbon does. And uh, so, uh, but if you're doing abrasive woods, if you're working with teak or ipe or jatoba, then it's going to hold up longer because it's kind of like the difference between carbide and steel. Carbide, you can't get as sharp as you can a good quality steel, but it'll hold that edge longer. And uh, so that's the trade-off. And I don't do exotic woods anymore. So everything, I've got one one hand plane with A2 in it, and that's it. Huh. Huh. Okay, so... Dumb question. Dumb question, right? Is high speed steel harder than A2 or BMB 11 or O1? I would imagine it is. Yeah. Uh, I know sharpening, you know, things like drill bits and stuff, it's, uh, it, it takes effort to do it compared to uh, okay. high carbon steel. Uh, yeah. Something we should mention too is, is, uh, PMV 11, uh, Lee Valley's. That's kind of a, uh, what should we say, a, a happy medium between high carbon and uh, the uh, uh, A2, which I don't know if the A2 is considered high-speed steel. It's cryogenically treated. I think it might be. That's probably one of the reasons it's harder to uh, to um, sharpen or, or tedious. I'm not a metallurgist mm-hmm. to, to you know speak of, but the PM11, I've got a couple of those, and I do like them. They, uh, they don't mm-hmm. sharpen quite as quick as the uh, high carbon steel, but they do hold a nice edge. So, uh, This question is from Chris. Um, and this is one that you've kind of gotten on me about in the past, Raleigh. Uh, can you discuss the effect that speed has on cut quality? Um, and immediately what comes to my mind is, is drill bits. But... Um, I'm intrigued by this, by the fact that my hand planes need to be razor sharp, but my jointer and planer aren't nearly as sharp, yet their quality of cut is comparable or crudely comparable, he says. But so, so how does that work? Cause he's right. Like, you know, a, a, my lunchbox planer blades are nowhere near as sharp as my hand plane. But if I use proper grain direction, it's pretty good yeah it's it bludgeons the wood off yeah it's <laughs> <laughs> okay so what's going on if it's bludgeoning it off but it's yeah. still coming nicely? well well brute force you know it it um, it has enough power that it can make uh even a not completely sharp blade power its way through the wood where you can't with a hand plane you get to a point where it just sticks in the wood but if you had if you had three horsepower behind that arm, you would push it through that wood, you know, no matter what the, the, the tear out or whatever would happen. That's why you, as long as you're going with the grain, it's going to do an adequate job of planting that board. Now, I just changed, I just rotated all the cutters in my planer yesterday, which that's a three hour job because you need to take yeah. the cutter out, clean the pocket, clean the cutter, put it back in. But it was cutting okay. It was working all right. But I rotated it to the sharp edge and now it's much quieter and the surface is velvety smooth because it's actually shearing the wood rather than beating it to death. And, uh, and, then, okay. and then if we add the fast feed rate, like people on a joiner, a lot of times just whiz it right over that joiner. Well, your cuts per inch have become a lot fewer. And that's what it's uh-huh. about is how many, how many times is that blade contacting the surface per inch? And of course, 
with a planer, you got a set feed rate, and on the lower feed rate, you get quite a few cuts per inch. So even marginally dull blades will work. Yeah, I have I have found that um, I tend to uh, rush things at the jointer, and that last you know I'll 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 notice the cut quality just goes immediately down. It's like hey, hang on, man, just slow down. And I do a nice slow feed across it, so there's more blades hitting right. per inch. They're taking off less wood per hit or whatever. Right. Now I'm going to start thinking of it as hit as opposed to cutting <laughs> <laughs> or bludgeoning, whatever. Bludgeoning, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, well, and, so and with a straight knife cutter, you you, uh, you basically usually have one blade that's doing all the work. Unless you're, yeah, yeah. unless you're really good at setting them up. So you want that one blade to get around there as often as possible. <laughs> well, and I'm a joiner. That one blade has a nick in it. No. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I need a little, do a little TLC on that one. Yeah. So, um, okay. Now let's talk about drill bit speeds. Drill bit speeds? Because, yeah, because you got on me one time because I never changed the speed of my drill yeah, press. Yeah, yeah. Well, a smaller diameter bit, bit needs more RPMs, uh, simple as that. A large diameter bit uh, can run at a slower RPM and, and do an efficient job of cutting because you have a wider cut area and, uh, I don't know, it just works better. You know, Same thing in metal. You get uh, yeah. RPM for smaller bits or RPM for large bits. And uh, mm-hmm. so you do want to change your speed. And, 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 bits it's one of the things i like about the new electronic drill press you just punch in the size of bit you're going to use the type of bit and the material you're using it in and it automatically sets your speed for you which is wow okay yeah that's i've been uh i've got a line on an old um like a 50s uh delta benchtop drill press Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a beast. I mean, even though it's a bench top, it weighs like, you know, a hundred pounds or whatever, sure. but it doesn't have a motor. Mm-hmm. Now I have a three phase, one horsepower motor just lying around. So I was thinking about getting, uh, phase one converter. Those, one of those, yep. Yep. One of those phase, phase, phase converters. Yep. Yeah. And then I can just dial in the speed as I want. Right. 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 Yeah. That would work. So, yeah. Uh, it's cheaper than buying a motor, and uh, you have the benefit of uh, a lot of torque out of a oh, okay. three-phase motor. Okay. Yeah. 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 Huh. All right. See, uh, I was just thinking the, the speed control would be the benefit, but well, that's, torque that's would benefit. be another yeah. thing. Yeah. When you get lower yeah. speeds, uh, yeah, and you can do that with a, uh, basically a DC motor. I mean, three-phase and DC are pretty similar. There again, I'm mm-hmm. I'm no electrician or electronics guy, but uh, variable frequency drives I'm familiar with because it's it's used so often now. And lathes are all VFDs, and and you see it lots of different places. That drill press, mm-hmm. yeah. Matter mm-hmm. of fact, the drill press is made by a company that predominantly makes lathes. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. They just stand it on end. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Add a quill. There you go. All right. Mortis and Tenon Magazine is a celebration of handcraft and historic furniture making. Published twice per year and without advertisements, it's more like a journal than a magazine. Mortis and Tenon explores period furniture, hand tools, green woodworking, and lots more for experienced and beginning woodworkers alike. Mortis and Tendon highlights the unique beauty of the handmade because timeless craftsmanship is worth celebrating. You can find out more or subscribe at mortisandtendonmag.com. That's mortisandtendonmag.com. Here's a good one. From Gabriel. I recently acquired a a half horsepower power feeder. Wow. And I'm thinking about using my table saw, using it on my table saw and jointer. I've never used a power feeder, but it seems like it would be helpful to face joint and possibly straight line rip rough lumber. 
I almost never see any articles or information about power feeders for, for small shops. Could you discuss their uses and limitations? So you did a blog for us a while back about uh, a power feeder you got. But so you, you're a fan of power feeders. Oh, and, and I guess that probably you, you have a pretty deep history. Like you used to have a commercial shop, right? right. So that, that probably informs a lot of what you do now sure. too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before, even before I got that, I was, uh, I had a project where I was actually using my table saw as a mill, you know, those cutter heads that you can put bits in so you can do molding oh, with. Okay. Yeah, I yeah, had to yeah. do, I had to do a triple flute down the middle of a board for some mill work. And there was no real good way to do it other than that. That turned out to be the optimum way. But feeding, feeding it uh -huh. by hand was horrible. So I bought a small power feeder, mounted it to my table sun. It worked great. I mean, it was consistent feed, so you got consistent cut. And then I decided, boy, that would work really nice for ripping. So I used it for a lot of ripping if I was ripping molding stock. And then I started using it on my router and revolutionized the router, it made it into a small shaper, basically, because mm -hmm. you have consistent feed rate so that you don't get all the little stops and starts, and maybe it feeds a little faster when it gets to a soft area, and we get back to that cuts per inch, and you get some rippling on it because you're going faster than the bit uh -huh. to cleanly cut. Well, with the power feeder, and I've got the little one that has the variable uh, speed on it. So I'll take mm -hmm. a, a piece of scrap of the same lumber that I'm going to use. So I feed it past the bit or past the table saw. I increase the speed of the power feed until you hear the, especially on the router, the motor bog just a little bit. And then I just back uh -huh. a little bit and that's your feed speed. And you just stand there and run the material through and it comes out clean. Even with things like raised panels. Uh, they're so much cleaner when you're using a power feed because you get that consistent rate. Um, on a joiner, I I probably wouldn't on a joiner because a joiner is one of those things where it's easy to taper boards. Uh, you're dealing with things that have a lot of crooks and bellies and concavities. And Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'll make two passes and then I'm sighting down the edge of the board to see what I'm doing and I'm going back to working on it. Plus, there are times where I really want to make sure I transfer my pressure to the outfeed table. Sometimes uh -huh. I'm on both tables, and it just um, – no, nah, I don't think it's ideally suited for that. But Okay. Yeah. If you're resetting on the bandsaw, it would be nice to get it set up for that uh, because you get a nice stay feed rate, and that's what keeps blade flutter at bay and, uh, and will give you a really nice clean cut. Yeah, I the the router table, even just little moldings and half rounds and things like that. There's always like one, there's always like one little dip that I get, you know. And mm -hmm. there's there's nothing you can really do. You can go back and try and get it, but you're you're hitting it with the sandpaper on a dowel or something, you know. Sure. Um, yeah, that okay. So, um, router table, big time. Yep. Uh, table saw straight straight line ripping. Yeah. Now, all right, dumb dumb question. Um, with where are you setting it up in relation to the fence and where are you setting it up in relation to the blade? Okay. I want, there are three wheels on them and I want two of the wheels on the infeed side and the third wheel mm -hmm. on the other side of the cutter, because I want that power pushing through, not pulling through. I want it pushing through and I want to make sure okay. that I have two wheels to hold it tight to the cutter. And then the third wheel on the end is just kind of clear the stock out. Once it's past the cutter, it pushes it away and uh, clears it. So then you can go over and grab your stock. There are times, where the, you know, if I'm working with small pieces where I'm running them through, you don't have to have your hands near a cutter. You're just running them in. <laughs> and uh, the one piece will push the other one completely clear. And you can just keep feeding, mm -hmm. feeding your stock in. Same thing on a, like a table saw if you're doing a rip. Two of the wheels in front of the blade, the third one on the back side, if you can do it. And uh, yeah, it, it works really well. Okay. I've, I've, uh, I've heard of people removing the middle wheel and straddling the blade is, is so that you're not cutting into it is if, if you have all three wheels, how are you not and and you're ripping? How are you not cutting into the, the wheel? The quarter inch rule. 
You know, your blade shouldn't go through the wood more than a quarter of an inch. So, okay, yeah. yeah so you really okay. So the 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 wheels are spaced out further apart than I'm imagining. Then yeah, you've got you've got a decent gap between at least two of the wheels. Usually, oh okay, two and okay. one. Some of them are three evenly spaced, but. I really haven't run into a problem where I've had to cut into the tires. I mean, okay. you just keep your blade low. And uh, I mean, you don't want your blade three inches out of the lumber anytime anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 So. Um, do you have a favorite uh, type of wheel? Like if I've, I've heard that there's different um, materials or anything, or you just... Yeah, I like, whatever. I like them a little stickier. Uh, Alan Ladd, okay. uh, Alan Ladd builds a kind of a do-it-yourself kit with a uh, uh, for a power feed. I did a, a tools and shops uh, or yeah, tools and materials uh, here. The, the, and it's drill powered or something. Well, right? drill powered. Now he sells a kit with a, a, a dedicated power source for it, but he uses okay. it, he uses skate wheels on it. And they're they're nice and pliable. They're like a, a sticky silicone or something. And uh, I really like the the wheels on that because they really hang on to the board uh, really well. Okay. I think they're I think they're uh, skateboard wheels because they're about two inches wide. And of course, those you get in all kinds of different durometers, uh, so you could kind of pick out what works best for you. And uh, oh, that makes sense. The skateboarders would have like you know for this surface i want this sure. for that thing yeah okay gotcha yeah and we're with my That's little my little variable speed power feed uh i got rid of my big one it was just too too big for my equipment here but my little variable speed it has basically one type of wheel you can get for i haven't found any aftermarkets and it's hard it, you know it's very durable but it can be slippery on some surface mm -hmm. so once in a while i have to help it along a little bit I don't care to do that. Okay. I'd like to find different tires for it. Huh. Okay. But the, the skateboard wheels just grab. Yeah. They're real sticky. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, this question is from David. My dear father still with us was a professional electrical engineer and an amateur woodworker. When he took early retirement in the 90s, uh, he invested heavily in a shop, buying some serious pro-quality machine tools, vintage hand tools, and wood. He has recognized the limitations of his age and has asked my brother and I to adopt, donate, or sell what he has. My brother and I are cut from the same cloth. We love tools and learned how to share once we became adults. <laughs> uh, we want to preserve the collection in the family, but many are beyond our means to store, power, or restore. As enviable and bittersweet as this task is, my biggest concern is many of the pro machine tools that have fallen victim to condensation rust on the beds over the last 10 years. How would you approach tool bed restoration? Would you answer differ? Would, would your answer differ if the power tools were to be kept, sold, or donated? We have access to a full machine shop, but limited time between us to do restoration. So um, not specifying like, what tools and pro like what what constitutes a pro level um like for me when i think pro level i think like you know sliding table saw and uh you know 20 inch planer or whatever but um so how do you go about restoring uh something like a planer bed uh evapor evapor rust is where i start that stuff is amazing because it's non-toxic yeah. really easy to deal with uh, the trick is flood it on and put some saran wrap in it and so that it doesn't evaporate quickly and just let it sit on there and check it out, you know, let it sit for a day or so. Uh, if these tools are something that you don't want any patination on, if you want them to look like new, well, then really the only way you're going to be able to do it is to machine off a certain amount of material on the top to get down to fresh material because once it's been mm -hmm. oxidized from rust, it's always going to have some patination to it. But uh, yeah. most people that are working with, uh, you know, professional quality tools are more interested in how well it works rather than if it has some patination. And the evapor yeah, okay. yeah, the evaporust will get rid of the rust. The, the metal will be a little bit darker. 
but that's not a big deal. Get, deal with the apple rust, then uh, work it down with steel wool. Uh, hopefully, there's no pitting in it, although that doesn't bother the functionality of it. It just is a little more unsightly. And then uh, mm-hmm. make sure you clean it off good with alcohol and then give it a treatment immediately of something to keep it from degrading. And uh, of course, my favorite is is uh, chameleon oil. You know, I use chameleon oil on everything. So I hose it down. Including your salads. Yep, that's right. Yep. I <laughs> put it in my hair, you know, for my black, you know, my hands get soft working with it. <laughs> so I, I'm a huge fan of Evaporos too, but I don't treat things with alcohol after. What, it, it, what, what am I missing? Uh, the alcohol, or you can use naphtha. Uh, it's it evaporates quickly and it cleans off all the residue that's left because evaporust has something in it that gives it a little bit of a coating when it's done. Okay. You know, to keep it from flash rusting. And you want to get that off. You want to get some lubricant of some kind on uh, there right away. And uh, something that isn't real pervasive because you sell it to somebody, they're going to put their style of lubricant on it. One of the big things is people will try three or four different types of lubricants and they don't like any of them because they don't clean the old stuff off. And if they've got something soft on the bottom, no matter what they put on top of it, it's not going to last. It's going to degrade real quickly because it, it's not bonded to the metal. It's bonded to whatever else they put on there. So this is your chance. If you've gone over the evaporous, you've gotten the rust off, cleaned it all off, gone over with naphtha or alcohol and put something on there that literally gets in the pores of the steel and you're going to have a lot better chance of keeping it slick and clean. Have you ever had, okay, now let's, let's, let's go to, cause I've, I've heard of it once, but you brought it up. Have you ever had a surface remachined? Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Was- what is that process like? I mean, like, cause when we did a, a planer setup video with Matt Wada and he had mentioned that the grooves on the side of the planer bed were so that you could machine the whole surface and that, that groove basically gave a, a relief surface, uh, on the, on the edges. Um, and that blew my mind. But then I thought about bringing this huge power matic, PM whatever planer bed to a machine shop is going to cost an arm and a leg. What What is that process like? Well, if you brought the whole machine, they just point to the door and say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to take the machine completely apart and bring the bed into them. And then they'll just... Yeah, it's still a thing. Oh, yeah, yeah it's still a thing. They'll use a milling machine and, and mill it flat. And uh, uh, yeah, it's it's tedious and it's expensive and so if you have something that's got a warped bed or uh you know some other anomaly like that it's going to be expensive to take care of so what 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 machine did you have it done on it was an old it was an old planer and it was okay it wasn't worth the effort (laughs) okay all right so was the bed warped or were you just trying to clean it up the bed was warped it was an old part planer and years ago, some of those weren't so very great. You know, they, I don't know if they didn't season their castings enough before they milled them. I have a feeling that that probably happened. And then they moved afterwards. I mean, that was the biggest problem with the early uh, generations of Taiwan tools that came into this country is the castings weren't adequately seasoned. And they got into this country with our, all of our huge temperature fluctuations and stuff moved. And uh, so... It, uh, they didn't quite understand seasoning castings the way they do in in, huh. in North America. So, but that's they seem it. to have gotten it down now. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's all. That's, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's 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 like early uh, compact disc recordings. They just didn't know how to master for it. It yeah. didn't sound worse. They just didn't do it right. <laughs> well, I don't and know. let the let the hate mill pr- proliferate. Yeah, in exactly. exactly. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen any. CDs sound better than vinyl, people. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Raleigh's on my team. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I like vinyls the- about romance, CDs about all music. Quality. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, 
Well, that's like that's all. That's the list of of questions that that I had set aside. Do you want me to go dig in or? Yeah, or, that's or, kind of lame. I mean, geez, give me something that I can make a pool out of my. No, I already <laughs> had, I already had several times already. So, uh, see, so well, let me uh, let me just pull up because you you can answer anything. So let me let me just I am I am random. Hey. I'm gonna randomly select a question. This one's from Craig. I'm looking to tackle some furniture projects for my adult children that they can put in their home and enjoy something that they can use and pass on. I have a deep collection of books from the year from years ago of measured drawings that are very detailed, isometric sketches works of art in themselves. Uh, several from Franklin Gottsall. Mm-hmm. That's who I was saying. Is that it? Yep. Very- okay. All right. All right. Um, should I first 3D model these designs from very detailed, from these very detailed, uh, but super crowded isometric sketches? Um, or can I mentally work out the workflow and create a cut list and individual detail components as well as full size sections where, um, that require printing and layout? I'm a recently retired engineer. There it is. There we go. Um, <laughs> And I'm very comfortable modeling. Uh, I have learned to use SketchUp for my own projects. Um, but uh, so I guess the, I guess what he's looking for is how do you go about taking? Well, yeah, these- Gatsal, Gatsal was really good at, you know, he, he, he gained access to a lot of museums, looked at a lot of old pieces, was allowed to measure them, make these drawings. But, you know, he, he's talking, you know, Gatsal would, would, put an entire high boy on one page and so oh yeah. wow okay yeah so it was really difficult to you know if you're really an experienced woodworker used to this stuff you're just going to use the major dimensions anyway and you're going to do everything else your own style unless you're really serious about making an absolute reproduction and then you're going to be familiar with all these pieces so Modeling it might be a real advantage because he can break it down into various uh, processes and it's going to be a lot easier to make a cut list because it will basically generate a cut list for you. And uh, so since he's so familiar with it and he's going to be very critical about the dimensioning and everything, uh, yeah, I would I would go ahead and model it first and then build from there. So Okay. Um, do, uh, do you use SketchUp or any modeling software? No, no. Or are you, you, your hand guy? Yeah, I'm a hand guy. I mean, I, I've built an awful lot of stuff with basic dimensions and some sketches and go from there. Yeah. yeah. I kind of know what's um, going on inside a lot of this stuff, you know, so. Uh, now, so how do you go about, um, coming up with an order of operations for a project? Do you start with the design? Do you start with. Um, with a finished product in mind, or do you just like, like say you're going to make a sideboard or, or, or a, just a table, like, how do you, how do you work that out through the process? I I start with some, uh, just basic dimensions on a sheet of paper and I start hand drawing, uh, just Mm -hmm. to sketch everything up because it's quick to change. You get the basic dimensions, you know, your proportions. And once I've drawn something that I like the proportions, like the balance on it, then I'll scale it out literally from that drawing because I, I know okay. my height and width and whatever. Uh, so then I can scale it out. Then I make a scale drawing and I'm still T square and triangles and uh, okay. yeah. And then go from there. Uh, you know, like I say, if it's, if it's a uh, say a sideboard or something, I really don't worry about the internal. So what goes on, okay. there, I'll make it as I put it together. Um, so I, so so you're you're an outside in guy. Yeah, when pretty much. Building. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. One one thing that that he had said is is that that feared word cut list. Um. Do you ever do cut lists? Oh yeah. Or are you a part list? Yeah. Well, or, so both. are you, I'll, I'll do both. I'll okay. do part, part lists. That is a cut list because I'm really fussy about my grain continuity and grain directions. So I want okay. all my parts labeled so that I know where I'm cutting them out of the board. That way, when I'm selecting stock, I lay it out and I'm putting part numbers on that stock that relate to my drawing. 
And that way okay. I know where everything goes and those numbers follow through all the way to the end. There's one thing that I'm a firm believer of, and that's hammer to fit and paint to match. So, you know, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just named the episode. <laughs> hammer to fit and paint, paint to match. match. I like it. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Do you have any thoughts on, uh, drying lumber? Yeah, you do. Oh, lots of thoughts on drying lumber. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I forgot you did a, you did a, um, you did a, uh, uh, moisture meter thing. Yeah. Didn't you? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah. See, probably you're the right guy for every question. Yeah. Really. That's it. yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, this one's from Dave. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or experience on using a gardening greenhouse as a solar lumber kiln. Assuming that I stack and sticker the lumber correctly, as well as allow for proper vent venting and fans for circulation, why would this not work? It seems to be a no-brainer, but I feel like I may be missing something. I can either have a greenhouse or, or, a, solar, or a solar kiln, not both. Getting double duty out of the buildings that may sit vacant for extended periods otherwise would be a huge win. What well, do you think? Well, the first thing you want to do is make sure that the sun isn't shining directly on the wood because you'll case harden it and surface check it so badly wherever the sun can hit it because that's intense in a, in a greenhouse. Even in the middle of winter, it's intense compared to the surrounding atmosphere. So the ideal... Oh. Yeah, the ideal drying of wood is is to allow the inside moisture to percolate out to the outside without stressing the outside. That's why commercial outfits that dry lumber fast, they use steam kilns uh, because they'll raise the temperature up to where the moisture is rapidly leaving wood, but they keep the outside surface of the board wet, literally damp from steam so that it doesn't case harden them and surface check. And then the next thing you have to worry about is internal shake. But in a greenhouse uh, type kiln, you don't have to worry about internal shake, but you do have to worry about surface checking and uneven drying. So you almost have to build a second wall inside to keep the sun off the wood directly and use that chamber between the greenhouse and that second wall as your heat developing area. Maybe you paint that wall black and then have circulation fans moving it around. And then you could uh, you could probably get somewhere with it, but you don't want the sun directly on it. Dang, Raleigh. I thought that was a simple answer. I thought it was, yeah, man, that sounds like a great idea. I'm going to go do it too. Yeah. That is, see, there's a reason for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Dehumidif wow. Dehumidification kilns are the best though, because they come closest to replicating nature in that they, okay. they just keep literally pulling the moisture out of the wood because it's hydroscopic, you know, it dries the outside a little bit. It's going to pull the moisture to the outside, but with the dehumidification kiln, you raise temperature up a little bit and it pulls the moisture out gently and it's a very okay. natural way of, of pulling it out. So, um, Steam, wow. steam kilns, the commercial stuff that we have that have been through steam kilns, they lose a lot of their flexibility in their, what would you call it, portional or shear aspect because they, uh, the water expands so quickly in those cells when they subject it to a high temperature that it ruptures the cells. And when it ruptures the cells, you lose a lot of the strength of the wood. It makes it great for getting the material out of there. Uh, for mill work, it really doesn't matter because you don't have a lot of stress on it. And if you take a look at uh, a lot of the commercial furniture being made, especially reproductions, antique reproductions, you see these antique reproductions of pressed back kitchen chairs that were so popular in the late 1800s up through the 30s. Those chairs, as you buy them off auctions and stuff or have them around your house, they have those nice, delicate, small legs that have lasted for 100 years. You know, they have bent legs, stuff like that. You look at the modern iterations, they got big fat legs. And the reason they have big fat legs is that commercially dried lumber that has been steam killed doesn't have the strength to have the nice spindly little legs because they'll go, as they say in Japan, baki. <laughs> <laughs> so 
and and that's that's just from the the stress on the cell walls of yeah the... yeah well it's yeah it's broken it's ruptured a lot of the cell walls and uh, you know it it basically takes strength out of the wood but it's very fast and that's one of the reasons that kiln dried wood is crap ola to try to bend uh, steam bend it is huh. really tough because it just it can't the same thing it it doesn't act like real wood it it doesn't have mm -hmm. that you can't compress it easily. Um, it just, um, it's something else. It, hmm. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a big Mac. <laughs> Jeez, Raleigh. You blew my mind. Yeah. That I thought it was so simple. Yeah. I, wow. Okay. Well, well dude, thank you so much. Oh, sure. Thank you for, for coming on and just answering some questions from the hip. And uh, yeah, we got to, like like uh, like somebody requested, we got to do it more often. Yeah, I, I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Well, good luck with your guitars. Yeah, tonight is, tonight is uh, the first band. We're going to... Uh, okay. We're going to bend a couple of sample sides to get the heat. I think it started out and, uh, and keep the temperatures and... Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It's, uh, I'm not going to make you suffer through Raleigh and I talking guitars. If you have any yeah, questions you'd like answered on the show, please send them into shoptalkatalk.com. Give us that thumbs up on YouTube. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you in two weeks.